Hi, my name is Methat. Today we're going to look at how we can use the code first development approach to develop an ASP.NET Core 2.1 application that uses Entity Framework 2.1. So before we get started, let us come up with a model of what it is we want to achieve. With code first development, you really don't need to do any SQL or database coding. You must think entirely about the object model. You come up with the model and then the tool will generate from the model the database artifacts. So let us get a sense of what it is we want to model. What I want to model today is players and teams. And specifically, I'm thinking of the NHL. That in the NHL, we have a bunch of players, and the players belong to teams. So when you think of teams, what have we got in a team? We'll try and keep it very, very simple. Of course, you can capture a lot of information about teams and a lot of information about players. But the more complicated we make it, the longer it's going to take us to, to complete the task that we're working on here. So let's say that as far as a team is concerned, we are interested in the team name, and we're interested in the city that the team represents, the province. In the case of the United States, it would be the state, and the country. And to bring this home, I'm going to use some examples. Let's say a team name is the Canucks. And the city would be Vancouver. The province would be BC. And the country would be Canada. As far as the players are concerned, what is it that we need to capture about the players? Well, we probably need to be, have a player ID. The first name of the player, the last name of the player, and the position of the player. As an example, let's say the player ID would be, say, 77. The first name would be Bob. The family name would be Hunter. And the position may be goalie. Okay. So this is what we want to model. I'm going to start an ASP.NET Core project. So that would be File, New Project. Let's choose Web here. And I will call the app MVC EF Core. So this is the name I'm giving my application. You can give it whatever name you want. And I'm going to choose Web Application Model View Controller. And I'm going to target ASP.NET 2.1. And as far as authentication is concerned, I will use the individual user account authentication and click on OK. And OK again. Now, we need to model the two classes we talked about. So those belong right in here, in the models folder. I'm going to create two classes. The first class I shall call team. And the second class I shall call player. So for team, I'm going to add this code here. These have to be resolved. So just like we mentioned before, a team 
is represented by the team name, the city, the province, and the country. And if we build the correct relationships between the team and the players, we will determine later on that when, when we do scaffolding, it will do the right thing. And that will come later when we see that in action. So in this particular case, we're building like a one-to-many relationships between the team and the players. So one team has many players. So within the team class, we have a collection of players. Let's now go back to the player class. So for the player, I've got the code for player two. Now, we need to step back a little bit here. With entity framework, it's all about convention. If you want a property to become a primary key, if you name it by the name of the class, followed by the word ID, the framework will immediately understand it as being a primary key. This is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is if you have a property that has simply the name ID, again, the framework will honor that and consider it to be a primary key. Any other name, if you want it to be a primary key, you need to annotate it with the keyword key. This is why if I go back to the team class, I want team name to be a primary key. But I did not call it team ID and I did not call it ID. Therefore, to educate the engine to make it a primary key, I had to annotate it with the word key. And this way it will turn it into a primary key. Now, coming back to the player, if you annotate it with key, then you're forcing it to be a primary key. If you give it the name player ID or ID, it will be a primary key. And if it is integer, player ID is going to be an identity column in SQL Server. So this pretty much explains it, except that we have here a foreign key type relationship in player because every player needs to belong to a team. So really the foreign key is team name and it has to have the same column name as what we have in the team class. And you might ask, why do we need this? This represents the team object in the player object. So putting these two together will really build a proper relationship that will scaffold properly. When we scaffold this and we add a player, the team will show up as a drop-down list. And this is the ideal way of doing it. Now, having created our model, we need to attach these teams and players to a database context class because the database context class is the interface that we have with the database. Now we have at this stage two options. We can either create an independent database context class or we can piggyback on a context class that already exists. By that I mean there is a built-in application DB context class that is right here. I can actually use this context class instead of having two context classes. If I want it all to end up in the same database, why not use the application DB context. So I will use this application DB context. I'm going to open this up and add two collections here that represent the teams and the players. 
And these are essentially two properties. And let me resolve this. So I'm saying that I want these tables in the database. I need a team's ta table and I need a player's table. And these are DB sets. This is all I need to do to get this working. Now if we go to the app settings file, this is the connection string. And the database name that will be created is going to be this very ugly name here. And of course, I don't like this, so I'm going to call it something else. I'll co simply call it NHL, which is much shorter. Where is this connection string referenced? This connection string is referenced in the startup.cs file because over here there is this code which is basically associating the application DB context with this connection string. So this is all we need to do. And it's done for us. So all the plumbing is there. Let us seed some data. Most developers, when they write code, especially code that pertains to a database, you want to have some sample data there. So I'm going to create some sample data that will seed the database so that when we actually create it, there's something in there. I shall create in the data directory a class called dummy data. This is the name I'm giving it. I will replace dummy data with this code. And if, if you look at this code, let's resolve these classes. Let me resolve this too. This code has a static method called initialize. And it takes an I application builder object. This code in here is so that I can get the context out of this I application builder object. So both these lines, this one and this one, is simply so I can extract the context from it. Because I need the context when it comes to adding dummy data. There is this command that ensures that the database has been created. This code is disabled here, but if you want any outstanding migrations to be applied, then you can execute this code. More about migrations, because we haven't yet talked about migrations. Here I'm checking, do I have any data in the team's collection. And if the team's collection is not empty, then I'm going to exit here. But if it is empty, then I'm going to add this code. Now, there are two methods here. One is called get teams, and the other one 
is get players. With get teams, we're creating a bunch of teams. We're creating the Canucks, the San Jose Sharks, the Edmonton Oilers, the Calgary Flames, and the Toronto Leafs. And one more, I guess, here. So there's quite a few here. As far as players are concerned, this method is a little bit different from the get teams method because it takes the context as an argument. Why do we need the context as an argument? The answer to that is every player belongs to a team. Therefore, in order to associate a team to a player, I have to find the team first and then assign the team name to the team name in the player's entity. That's why I need to have a context here. Because I'm doing a query here. I have a bunch of players. This one belongs to the Canucks. This one belongs to the Canucks. And we have a player with the Flames and a player with the Oilers. I'm sure that some of these names are not real. And some are. Now this code should initialize for us the database. The question is, where do we call this code? We can call this code from the startup.cs fi file. In the startup.cs file, in the configure method, I can actually call this code and I can pass it this app object because from the app object it will be able to find the context. Let me just make sure that my app compiles without any errors and sure enough it seems to be okay. No errors. The next step is to carry out what we call migrations. And what are migrations? If you look under the data directory, there's a migrations directory. And in the migrations directory, there is a file that was created with a bunch of zeros and it's called create identity schema. And in here, you will see that we have this so-called fluid API that generates for us tables. In this particular case, these are the tables needed by the identity framework. The identity framework is going to create these tables, ASP.NET roles, ASP.NET users, and so on and so forth. This was created for us when we created our application from the template. Now we have actually added more to the model. There are two entities that we added. We added the teams and the players. And they're nowhere to be found here. There are two very important commands called migration commands. And I will show you what they are. The first one is .NET EF migrations add and then you give it a name. You can give it whatever name you want. In this case I would say NHL because we added some NHL players and teams. And the other one is .NET EF database update. This one is going to generate the fluid APIs for teams and players. And this one down here, it's going to actually 
create the tables in the database, but not seed. It is not going to seed. The seed happens when we run the application. Now, this is using the .NET utility. There's another way that you can execute these migrations, and they are through what we call the package manager console. If you want to get to the package manager console, you have to do this. This package manager console, it is a PowerShell terminal inside of your application. So I'm going to just give it a shot, go to Tools, NuGet Package Manager, Package Manager Console, and it's going to open up a console right here. And in this space, I can execute some PowerShell commands. For example, I can type in the command get process. And this is going to get all the processes that are running on my machine. So this is a PowerShell window inside of Visual Studio. I said here that you can execute these migration commands using the .NET terminal utility, or you can use the package manager. And if you're using the package manager, this would be the command. PowerShell commands are made up of a verb hyphen a noun, always. So for this particular command, which is migrations add, the equivalent package manager command would be add migration, and then you'd give it a name, NHL. Or as far as this .NET EF database command is concerned, you can say update database, and it will do the job. So let me come here and use the PowerShell command. So I'm going to come and paste this in here, and let's execute it. So look what happened here. It created for us this file under migrations. The first part of this file is like a timestamp and then underscore the name you gave it. Let's have a peek at what's in here. You can see now that there is this fluid API that is intended to generate for us the two tables. Even though you might not be very, very f familiar with fluid API, you can look at this command and pretty much understand what it's trying to do. This is trying to create a table by the name of teams. And the columns of that table are these. And you see the team name is the primary key. This is exactly what we intended. Let's go back and look at the players table. For the players table, the table name is players. The properties are these. And the primary key is player ID. Again, there is a foreign key relationship here. A foreign key relationship between the team name in the player's entity and the team name in the team entity. So there's a primary key, foreign key relationship right here. So now we have created our migrations. When we update the database, first, this is going to be executed, which is the entities that pertain to the identity framework. And then this will be executed which is the two entities that we created. So let us now execute the command update database. Just to prove to you 
that it really doesn't matter whether you do, do this from the package manager console or whether you do it from the terminal window, even though the commands are different, they do the same thing. So let me actually execute the second command from a terminal window. So I can com come here into a terminal window in this folder and I can do .NET EF database update. So if we execute this, this is the piece that is going to actually execute those fluid APIs against the database. So let's hit enter here. And notice that we added a migration in the package manager console, but we're updating the database from a terminal window. You can mix and match. At this point, all of these commands were executed. And these are all create table commands. And they're actually, what you see here, is plain and old simple SQL commands, SQL DML commands. Let's find out for sure that indeed these tables have been created in the database. So let's go to SQL Server Object Explorer. If you don't see this pane, on this side, you can always go view SQL Server Object Explorer, and it should open up here. Now, if you come to the database, if you don't see the database that we created, I know that we created a database called NHL, but I don't see it here. And that could be because I need to refresh the databases. And sure enough, here is the database that we created, NHL. I can expand and see my tables. And you know what? We have these two tables, players and teams. Let's look at the definition of these. When you look at the definition, you can see that team name is made a primary key, and we have city, province, and country. Let's look at the other one, the players. Here we can see that player ID is a primary key. And if you click on this and look at the properties, and down here you can see that this is an identity column, which is an auto-incremented column, primary key. Now, we haven't even tried this application. We haven't even run it once. Let's run it now, knowing that we put some code in the startup configure method that should execute. And if that code is executing, it should seed for us the database. Let's try that. So now I'm running the application. If it had any problems seeding the database, it should have crashed at this stage. But because it hasn't crashed, I'm pretty confident that our database has indeed been seeded. Let's go back and have a look. So I can go into players here. I'll right click on players and choose view data. And there you go. We have our players. And the players have the appropriate foreign keys. We know that this guy belongs to the Canucks. John Rooster belongs to the Flames, and so on and so forth. That's the way it was intended to be. Now, let us add some controllers and views. In other words, let us scaffold these two entities that we created using tooling in Visual Studio 2017. 
So I'm going to come to Solution Explorer and add a controller at this level. Add controller. And I'm going to choose MVC controller with views using entity framework. For the model class, I'm going to scaffold both of my entities, the team and the player entity. Let me start with team. So this is my team entity. And for my context class, let me see what I've got. I have only one context class, the application DB context. So that's easy. That's an easy decision to make. Choose that and click on Add. Let me add another controller. This time I'll add the player controller based on the player entity. So I'll choose player here and click on Add. If I want to test this thing out, let me compile and refresh. To hit the Teams controller, I must add to the URL Teams. And that should take me to the index action method in the controller. Let's have a look at the controller first. We have two controllers that were added here. The player's controller and the team's controller. Let's check out the team's controller. What have we got? We have the index method here. We have details, create, edit, and probably delete. So all of these have been scaffolded for us. So let me go back here and try to get at the teams. If I enter teams at the very end here, I expect that I will hit the teams controller. And sure enough, here it is. Let me add this to the menu system so I don't have to always enter this stuff in the URL. And to add it to the menu system, I need to go to views, shared, and modify this file because this is where the menu system is placed. Let me go and change that. I'll add two of these. The first one, I'll call it team. The controller is actually teams. And the second one, the controller is called players. For the teams, the action method that we want to point to is simply index. And that's the same for players. What we want to display on the home page is teams here and players here. Let's save. And now let me refresh. Let me go to the home page. And when I go to the home page, sure enough, I see teams and players. Let me have a look at players. Let me create a new player. So I'll create a name called Fred Farmer. And pos position is right wing. And what's amazing is because we did the relationships property, the team name shows up here as a drop-down list. If you didn't do the relationships properly, you'd have to code that yourself. So let's add this guy to the flames. And sure enough, Fred Farmer has been added to the flames. This is all I wanted to cover regarding code-first development. And Thank you for watching this video.